Hello, this is Matt Foy. I will be the lead storyteller on this introduction to salmon habitat restoration in Scoustamook, the lower mainland of southern British Columbia. So the story will be where we've been with salmon habitat restoration over the last number of years. What have we learned? And what's our hope for the future? Now, the idea of such an introduction course came from a group of uh, individuals working together on a salmon habitat restoration um, project in a remote watershed here in the lower mainland, the Upper Pitt River. It's one of those sites that requires getting into a boat, then heading up to uh, up a logging road, and often it requires an overnight stay in the beautiful Pitt River Lodge. And the individuals involved in this salmon habitat restoration project often had time just to sit down, express their ideas, their thoughts, uh, discuss the topic of salmon habitat restoration. So it became clear that there might be a value for uh, students just starting out wondering where their education and, and career paths might take them. Uh, technical people already in this salmon habitat restoration field that might want to know a little bit more on the whys. Why are we doing certain activities? What is the, the purpose, the ultimate goal? Or just average community members that want to know what is this salmon habitat restoration? What does it mean? And what does it mean to the salmon that I care about? So this group of individuals uh, collaborating on this project uh, all, all represented different uh, groups that were part of this work to help uh, salmon in this watershed. So the key groups were um, Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance, KC First Nation, Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and the World Wildlife Fund. All diverse groups but all coming together with a common purpose. And again, talking about salmon habitat restoration. So this is going to be a long and winding story. I hope you stick with it. I think there's lots of interesting little side stories and examples we'll be going through over a series of lessons. And where are we going to begin this story? Oh, in, in one of my favorite places in Stauskamut, the upper Chilliwack River. If you look at the bottom right hand uh, part of this slide, you'll see two little red sockeyes. That is roughly where this watershed is. So hopefully you enjoy this story and off we go. So before we get started on this long and winding story about the introduction to salmon habitat restoration, I just want to lay out how we have organized uh, these discussions. We've broken it into four lessons and each lesson revolves around a basket or a group of salmon that do somewhat similar things. So there's four groups of salmon we're going to talk about. So the first lesson will focus on a single species of salmon, Chinook salmon. And we call it the Tai team. And the reason we designate it a team is Chinook salmon is a very variable, uh, has a life history that's extremely variable. So in fact, certain Chinook salmon do things almost so much differently than other Chinook salmon, they could almost be viewed as separate species. So we're going to talk about some of this variability in our area, Skashtamuk, the lower mainland of BC. And we'll use three examples in that discussion. In lesson two, we're going to talk about another group of fish, pink salmon, sockeye salmon, and chum salmon, but only certain forms of sockeye and chum that do things similar to pink salmon. And I'll explain that later in the lesson. And these fish, spawn in the major parts of the river, the main flow, some of the bigger side channels. Uh, so we've given them a name, the clean stream 
15. Okay, stream spawning salmon. Third group, another group of uh, fish. In this case, we're focusing on, again, uh, chum salmon and sockeye salmon and a new one, coho salmon, but again, only certain forms. And these forms are all linked together on the type of habitat they seek out based on upwelling groundwater. And for that reason, we gave them the name Water from the Earth Team. Third, fourth group and last group. Coho salmon, steelhead, and cutthroat, what are known as trout, but they're all in the genus Oncorhynchus. So for this lesson, we put them together as part of a salmon team. They're all the same genus. And they all do something similar in that this group lives in streams for one or two years, or in case of cutthroat trout, some forms live their whole life within the stream. And because of that, the habitat, salmon habitat restoration uh, activities that are focused on their group are, can be quite different than some of the other groups. Okay, so these are designated the backyard team. These are the fish that truly live in many people's backyard. So I hope you enjoy uh, these lessons. I hope you're patient and get a chance to listen to them all. They're meant to make people think, make to have deep discussions about some of the ideas and thoughts brought up in these lessons, and ultimately perhaps to make plans how you may play a role in supporting salmon habitat restoration, or in fact, perhaps directly undertake salmon habitat restoration in your home streams. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. And as I said, it's a long and winding story. I guess we'll talk more at the end. So lesson one has been broken up into a series of modules that discuss certain subjects. Module one will talk about the historical context of how salmon habitat has been affected by land use activities and makes an argument why salmon habitat restoration is a useful tool in supporting populations uh, impacted by this development. Module two discusses a recommended reference document on the techniques of salmon habitat restoration. Module three uh, discusses uh, and defines these various techniques found within this this document that may be appropriate to certain species and certain watersheds using Chinook salmon as an example. And there is an emphasis on thoughtful research and discussion on factors thought to limit these Chinook salmon populations. Module 4 contrasts two Chinook salmon populations, the Upper Pitt and Harrison Rivers, just to illustrate how each has different issues limiting their population which then dictate what restoration techniques might be effectively applied. So in module five, we just carry on with this uh, description of the Upper Pitt and Harrison Rivers, this comparison, and with a final summary how certain restoration activities will likely have different outcomes between these two, uh, two uh, Chinook populations here in the Lower Mainland. In module six, we'll have one last example of a habitat restoration and population recovery program delivered for a threatened population of Chinook salmon in Mariah Slough. And finally, on, on the uh, last two slides of this presentation will be all the references of various links that have been placed in the presentation. They'll all be listed in the last two slides. And for the YouTube uh, example of this presentation, hopefully we'll be able to put this, this reference slide in the description of the YouTube video so all those links you can get and read up on these various papers and, and articles and videos related to the presentation.
what this little haiku is meant to invoke is um, the upper Chilliwack River represents an undisturbed large or medium-sized river floodplain that has not been logged, has been has not been eroded, has not been disturbed. And all the features you can see in front of you, the gravel bars, the mature forest on each side, and even if you look off to the right-hand side, you'll see large trees have fallen down as the river is migrating, and they're creating large woody debris along the bank. They're not small trees, so being large trees, they don't wash downstream very easy. So they naturally make these banks more stable and they provide this excellent habitat. So in some ways, the upper Chilliwack River represent the ideal salmon stream in Sultimax. And I want to refer to it, but I also know it's unique. It's almost the only low elevation salmon stream left in our area. So that is why salmon habitat restoration is something that we must do for the other rivers that we have impacted over the last century or more. So when we talk about salmon habitat restoration, we must be realistic that we are not returning it to a pre-disturbance state. So we're looking at a picture of the Chilliwack River watershed in 2020. This is the watershed that we live in. If you look at the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a little red arrow and a yellow star and a dark green patch. That's the lower section of the upper Chilliwack River, the section that we began this talk with. It's a undisturbed watershed. It's relatively low elevation and it supports salmon. Uh, actually, it supports sockeye salmon, coho salmon, and chinook salmon. So most of the watershed in, uh, is south of the U.S. border, and this picture just shows to the U.S. border. But south of this picture is the North Cascades National Park, and that's the upper portion of the upper Chilliwack River. And that part of the watershed is totally undisturbed. And the lower section in Canada is now in an ecological reserve. So this watershed is almost unique in Stauskabuk. It is the only undisturbed medium-sized watershed that supports salmon. If you look at the picture of the watershed, notice the colors. The darker greens are older, but as they get lighter, they're younger for us. So what you can see just from this visual image is almost the entire watershed is young forest, either from logging or largely from human caused fires. So this is the watershed, the salmon that we know exist in today. It's not the watershed represented by the upper Chilliwack River from 150 years ago. So again, when we talk about salmon habitat restoration, we cannot turn it to a pre-disturbance state. Only long time periods can do that. So what can we do? So what we generally mean when we're talking about salmon habitat restoration, we're trying to restore certain processes and diversity within these impacted watersheds that give salmon, the young salmon, that chain of critical habitats as they move through their life cycle, that they can successfully survive to spawn. Now, this is not a simple or easy task. And that's why I think we need to be all humble when trying to restore habitat. This is a really difficult challenge and it requires a lot of thought. So we have to be very careful when we try to restore habitat. We have to do it as thoughtfully as we can. We have to learn from others' mistakes and successes and try to make the most positive impact for salmon that we can with our actions. And when we do take those actions, it is really important to assess if we made any difference good or bad, for salmon. And then we learn from our experiences and just try to do better next time. So we know very little, surprisingly, how this great complex ecosystem 
called the salmon ecosystem works we control even less so that word humble yes we have to remain humble so if you recall the previous picture of the upper chilliwack river i showed you there was an eroding bank on the right right hand side of the river and as the river migrated into that bank, large mature, mature trees were undercut and ultimately fell into the river and the current pushed them against the bank. So the size of the trees made, made it less likely that those tre trees would be easily moved downstream. So they effectively hardened that bank, made it more stable. Not only did they make it more stable, but those trees themselves form complex log jams that provide good hiding spaces for young and adult salmon. So that is the nature of uh, mature forests dealing with river migration. So this is an aerial picture of the upper Chilliwack River. Just to show you from, from a different point of view, the river has a relatively narrow river corridor with mature forests close to the river's edge, which is important for what I just described, stability of those river edges. There are sediment sources feeding into the upper Chilliwack River from the high mountain uh, snowfield streams. The very steep streams have sediment pulses coming down into the river. And that sediment tends to stabilize above large, stable log jams. They have a damming effect during high flows, and that gravel tends to deposit upstream. If you notice in this picture, I pointed out with three little green stars, at least three large log jams and their associated gravel bars upstream. If you look off to the right hand side of the picture, you see a little blue star. That's a stable wetland. Uh, we'll talk later off channel habitat, which is critically important habitat, particularly in the winter for species like coho salmon. So I'm going to show you at the end of this discussion a picture of Celesi Creek. It's farther downstream in the Chilliwack watershed. It's been heavily logged. So in contrast, the river channel has tended to widen and has young forests along the bank. So remember, young forests are smaller trees. So as, this, as the river naturally migrates against the bank, those smaller trees are undercut, similar to the old trees, but they fall in and wash away. They do not stabilize the bank. So in fact, the banks are less stable, so more sediment is generated each flood more quickly. So that puts more sediment into the main channel, which has other consequences downstream. So if you look at the picture, there's more extensive gravel bars, and you don't see any of these large wood jams, which tend to stabilize that moving gravel. So generally, the clearance of forests results in younger trees, weaker riverbank stability. The increase in road density during the logging phase increases the landslide frequency, which generally leads to more sediment hitting the river channels, again destabilizing all related to this increase in in-stream sediment. So these changes from a stable watershed like the Upper Chilliwack to a less stable watershed like Celesi Creek in the same watershed. In this case, primarily due to logging, but it also can be impacted by other land development activities in other watersheds. They're all generally push the habitat in a poor condition that is bad for salmon survival. And again, getting back to our discussion, why do we do salmon habitat restoration? We're trying to push back on these processes that have been changed by our use of the land base. So what do we mean when we say we are trying to restore processes and structural diversity in the impacted watersheds that give the salmon the chain of critical habitats they need to successfully fulfill their life cycle. So thinking back to the undisturbed upper Chilliwack River, this is to a large degree uh, the type of habitat that these species that we know, our salmon species, have evolved in over the last five or 6,000 years. So what did we see? We saw relatively narrow uh, stream corridors. 
Uh, large wood, when the river comes against it, makes these hardened banks that are complex, lots of places to hide. When those trees do wash downstream, they're so large, they jam and form large log jams that are lar don't move that easily. Again, a place of refuge during floods. Within the floodplains, you see various wetlands that provide refuge habitats for small fish to go in, maybe in the summer, in the spring, in the winter, in the fall. So in contrast, Celestia Creek, many of those features do not exist or ex are much rarer in that Celestia Creek example. So what does, it, what does it matter? Well, let's just think and do, do some numbers here. So assume one male and one female salmon spawn together and bur bury their now fertilized, let's say somewhere between 1,500 and 6,000 eggs, depending on the species and the size of the female, into a nest on the bottom of the stream. Now, some years later, some of those eggs had survived and came back as adults to spawn their own offspring. But let's just think about this. To survive from egg to adult meant that they had to make a whole lot of decisions and move through a whole lot of habitat, find food, not get killed or die, and grow big enough to be able to swim back to their home spawning grounds and did not die once home in their home stream before they can successfully get into the their eggs back in the bottom of the stream. So from the many thousands of their brother and sister sisters eggs, if only two survive to get back home, the salmon run will remain stable. But if three get back home, the salmon run will increase. But if only one salmon returns from the parent's family, then the run will decline. And if this keeps up, the run will disappear and be no more. So when you think about the odds of survival, when 3,000 of your brothers and sisters can die many different deaths, physical trauma, predation, disease, starvation, and us, often us, and you and your cousin are the only survivor to keep the run going. So in my world, miracles truly happen. And salmon, the salmon we see spawning in our streams are truly a miracle. So when we stay, we are trying to restore processes and structural diversity. We're simply talking about trying to take actions to ensure that there are enough safe places for these eggs and little fish to survive and grow and thrive so we won't lose our precious salmon runs. Simple in theory, but very hard in practice. So during this presentation, I'm not really going to get into the uh, minute details of the various techniques of salmon habitat restoration. But this report, this, this uh, report that was done in the 1990s, I think is, is the best reference guide for our experience here in British Columbia. It was done by the BC Watershed Restoration Program, 1997. And it describes all the tools one might consider when trying to restore salmon habitat. Now, each of these tools have their limits and the outcome, whether they're successful or not, largely relates to how well you apply these specific tools to a very specific problem that you understand well. So a bit like the old construction saying, measure twice, cut once my suggestion about salmon habitat restoration is think twice then again and then again then act once and then go see what happened was it a successful effort or a failure and if it was a failure you learn if it was success you learn you adjust and your next, next effort, hopefully, will be more successful.
So why I find this Watershed Restoration 1997 report such a useful reference for the BC restoration experience is if you look down the list of authors on the various subjects, many of these individuals started their careers in the 60s, 70s. And during that era, salmon habitat restoration was a brand new field. It just was not being done in BC. So these folks work through the challenges and develop techniques in real world experience. And from that real world experience, they've passed on this knowledge in these various chapters. Now these folks, we owe a debt of gratitude for the skills they brought to the task, the creativity, and now they've passed that on to us. Looking around to the area of Stausch Kamut, the teams that have formed over the last number of years have built their skills on the backs of these authors, these authors' experiences. And the new teams are trying creative things and learning and, and experimenting. So again, this is uh, an interesting business. We don't have all the answers. It's gonna require a lot of thinking, a lot of discussion, and hopefully some action and learning to help our friends, the salmon, because we are in fact the salmon people, the Stausch Kamut. Okay, so let's quickly describe what each of these tools generally means here in Stausch Kamut, because they often mean somewhat different things in other areas. So this is a discussion about here. Remember, salmon habitat restoration is often a very personal activity, quite specific to time and place, where it is really important to know what your particular area requires for tools and how each tool can act here and not over there somewhere. So quickly, restoring fish access, if we go down this table of contents, often often refers in our area is uh, fixing fish passes past culverts. We live in a very urbanized area, which include roads and roads have to pass streams under them. And that usually is a bridge or it often in the smaller streams culverts. And these culverts can be a problem for upstream migrating salmon, adults and juveniles. So there's a whole bunch of activities in our area trying to make these old culverts that weren't particularly sensitive to fish become fish friendly. Add to that hydroelectric dams that were built early in the 20th century, many without fish passage, and they're operated not considering salmon downstream. So this is the idea of uh, restoring fish access in and around hydro dams. And sometimes it means uh, clearing passages past landslides that fall into the stream and stop salmon migrating upstream. Just in the last few years, there's been large rock slides that have happened on the Seymour River in North Vancouver that effectively ended that run unless the salmon habitat restoration teams took action, which they have. And even more recently on the Fraser River up at Big Bar, where a perfectly natural landslide, a major landslide blocked off the Fraser River created a many meter high waterfall and it was the end of the upper Fraser salmon run unless we took action and we have and that's part of the story so that's fish access if you also read in that section it talks about improving spawning gravels in certain areas of the stream for spawning salmon now salmon have a particular size of gravel that they use for spawning it can't be too big and it can't be too small and various things we've done to rivers have either degraded the gravel and making it more coarse and unusable, that often happens below hydroelectric dams, or made it finer because the, uh, we've logged the stream, stream watershed, stream banks are unraveling, so there's lots more sands and silts and the gravel quality declines. What can we do to give salmon what they need for spawning? So the other point as we work our way down the table of context is off channel. And I have given a number of courses on just this subject. So if you visualize a river, the main river that you are, are looking at 
off to the side in the floodplain is often littler channels that come off the river called side channels. Often there's a log jam at their head end, or sometimes they're back sloughs of river that's not connected at the upper end, but at the lower end. They are connected during flood, but not at other times. And if you go farther out, out across the floodplain, you'll find all sorts of channel scars from where the river was, because the bottom line is rivers move over time and they leave these scars behind. All these scars, if they're wetted, are what is defined as off-channel. And it's in these quiet places that some of our most critical spawning and rearing refuges exist in rivers that we've destabilized from our actions. So that's a whole section off-channel that is, I'll talk more about today. Wood debris. There's a section on wood debris. Debris and what it really is is just logs placed in piles called log jams and boulders. These are all meant to make rivers that have become simplified because they've partly unraveled, let's say, high amounts of sediment have moved in because of impacts on the land. We try to put some complexity, log jams and boulders, so when the high water comes, the energy of the water scours deeper spots around the log jams and the boulders. And when the low water comes, we have pools for fish to sit in. So there's a whole section log jams. Now there's a couple chapters on rehabilitating main stem pools. And this speaks to the fact that spawning adult salmon and actually juvenile salmon like to hold in the deeper pools because these pools give them a better chance to get away from predators like birds, kingfishers, herons, and other predators like otters in the freshwater environment. An open water pool, they can see the predator coming and avoid them, or they can dive deep where uh, predators like kingfishers can't get them. Unfortunately, when we develop watersheds, as we've described, often there's higher sediment loads coming from uh, upslope and banks eroding, and it tends to simplify the stream. Also, the size of the wood has declined, the size of the logs, so it's not as stable, and it tends to be more mobile. So that description I, I showed of the upper Chilliwack River, where the large logs, trees had been undercut by erosion as the river did migrate, they had fallen over, but they hadn't moved very far, and they create a hardened bank. So in a flood, they took the energy out of the flood, and it resisted, it slowed the erosion of the bank, but also that energy was focused downward and it scoured a deep channel, deep pool beside that large wood. So at low water, you had a deep pool with this complex wood debris. That doesn't exist in many of our developed streams. What these, sub, these, uh, these two chapters talk about is what can you do in these impacted streams to recreate these deeper pools for the salmon that are looking for them. Now I'm just going to refer to another really excellent report on the subject called Stream Analysis and Fish Habitat Design by Bob Newbury and Mark Gabbery. These two folks cut their teeth on relatively channelized streams in the Canadian prairies and transferred that out to the west coast. Both are excellent uh, uh, advocates for working with these techniques with a wealth of knowledge and I highly recommend have a look at that, at that book. So going down again, low level nutrient addition. Um, again, it's effectively putting nutrients into a stream to promote algae, which feeds more insects, which feeds more little salmon. Now you have to be careful, you don't put too much else. The whole system can get too productive, but the idea is to to give those nutrients to a stream to make little salmon grow. And part of the story is the wealth and abundant salmon runs of the past generally are not the case for the present. Both from habitat uh, disruption over the last 100 years and from fishing activity in the ocean, less salmon come back to the stream. And those salmon were critical in bringing ocean nutrients into relatively no low nutrient streams in the past and those nutrients from the bodies of the salmon then fed the ecosystem that fed the little salmon that made more of the big salmon so the idea of low level nutrient addition 
was to put some of those nutrients back into the stream that we've lost as our salmon runs have declined. The next point is managing beavers. Talks about my favorite stream animal after salmon. I really like beavers. So they make things like beaver ponds, which coho fry absolutely love to live in and grow fat. But also, unfortunately, the ponds are created by beaver dams, which can prevent the upstream spawning salmon uh, migration above the pond where they want to spawn. So if they can't get past the beaver dam to spawn in the little tributary above the beaver dam, those little coho fry that would have done great in the beaver pond aren't there. So this whole chapter talks about how can we have beavers existing in the same areas as, as young salmon, principally coho salmon, cutthroat trout, and some steelhead trout. And there's a really interesting talk on how to manage these sort of competing values of positive and negative. So I think this touches on most of the subjects that the, the book, uh, this report delves into in great detail. But I think we should carry on with our story before we get into these uh, minute details of the toolbox of restoration techniques. As we begin our story today, we have just introduced you to the why part of salmon habitat restoration, because the streams are not what they once were. We have just touched the toe into the how part with the unveiling of the infamous Blue Toolbox book. But before we dive deep in the what part of the story, I want to say a little about the who part. So you're going to hear us say a lot that salmon habitat restoration can be complicated and always requires much thinking and a whole lot of talking before action should be considered. So giving, given the complicated nature of this work, one friend I would highly re recommend you talk to if you decide to actually begin your own salmon habitat restoration journey toward a successful project is Fisheries and Oceans Canada Salmon Enhancement Program, your local community advisor, known as the CA. So way back in 78, when SEP program was born, some wise souls figured out a lot of good-hearted people wanted to help the big bad government do something for our endangered salmon friends. And so a special position was created to as the go-to person for DFO when you wanted to talk about salmon, how to help them, and even consider salmon habitat restoration for them and that person was your local ca now i say local because each ca has been assigned a geographical territory and as of 2021 there were four cas each with their own patch here in skashtabuk so when the thinking begins these folks would be my first call to get that ball rolling and help point you in the right direction. So here's a link to their digital home. Control click, have a read. They truly are friends of the salmon here in Slack, Skoskadok Tamuk. So let's talk about salmon habitat restoration. So this is the thinking part of doing this work. And it's simple in theory, but it is hard in practice. So why is it hard? So let's, let's think about this. So what salmon are we talking about? There are five different species of salmon here in British Columbia. Chinook, Chum, Sockeye, Coal, Pink. And they exist in the streams in Skushkamook here. These are our fish. And six salmon, if you think steelhead should be called a salmon, not a trout. 
And which one of these do you want to ha restore habitat for? Because they all have different habitat needs. So they all belong to the same species, genus. They're just different species. Oncorhynchus is their genus. So steelhead are no more different than pink salmon, as is the Chinook salmon. For that matter, how about cutthroat trout? They are all called Oncorhynchus. So that's seven now. Different salmon species, different needs, different requirements. It's complicated. So if each species are quite different in their critical habitat needs, how do you restore habitat to help each of them? It's not simple. So let's talk a little bit about the various salmon species and how they use their freshwater estuary habitats, which are the areas we have some chance of applying restoration techniques on. So out of this gang of seven, let's start with one of my favorites, Chinook salmon. And let's call all the forms of Chinook. So I want to say that every population of Chinook does things somewhat differently in their freshwater environment. Chinook are amazingly adaptive and variable in terms of their life history. Each population has slightly different ways of using habitat. So we'll just call it the Tai team to be simple. All those variations of Chinook, the Tai team. So what's Tai? It's an ancient name for this chief of salmon, so the Tai Tain. Now, ju just working with this one species of salmon will give us a sense of some of the complicated thinking one must do when planning for salmon habitat restoration. Okay, so let's dive in and swim a little bit with these beautiful fish. So the Tai Tain, Chinook salmon, Oncorhynchus shawashta has a number of names here in Northwest North America. King salmon of Northern Washington Swoop Strait, the Tai salmon of Campbell River, Blackmouth, Puget Sound, or Quinnat salmon of Northern California. So Chinook, this species, spawn in just a very few streams in Scotiabank, but they also spawn in many of the streams throughout. The mid and upper Fraser River watershed. And their natural distribution in the world, well, they can be found spawning as far south as the Sacramento River in California, up through Oregon, Washington, BC, Alaska, across the Bering Strait, down the Asian coast, along the large Kamchatka Peninsula of northern Russia, and as far south as Hokkaido Island of northern Japan. So it gets around to some pretty far away places. Now our local Chinook tend to be three to five years old, but some Chinook are the oldest species of salmon in the world, up to seven years old. And these older ones tend to spawn in the far north, colder streams or the interior streams. Now they're known for their size. They're the largest bodied Pacific salmon in the world. Now here in Skoshtamook, the largest Chinook salmon probably returned to the Harrison River. 30, 40, and even 50 pound salmon would not be unheard of in that river. But in three rivers in North America, they get much bigger. One is the Kenai River of Alaska, the Kalem River of the Lower Skeena River near the community of Terrace, and the Wanak River in the central coast of BC near the community of Owakino. In these rivers, fish above 80 pounds would not be rare. So how big can they get? Well, here's a picture of a small one on the Kalem River. Of all the hundreds of salmon streams in Shtashkamuk, only a very few streams have naturally occurring populations of Chinook salmon spawning in them. There are a number of streams where Chinook salmon have been, uh, eggs have been collected from one stream, put into a hatchery, and then transplanted into them. But the reality is only a few streams have natural populations. They've always been there. They're unique and adapted to those streams. So in our area, there's eight of them. The Harrison River, 
the Lillooet River, the Birkenhead River, Big Silver Creek, which is a tributary of Harrison Lake, the Chilliwack River, Mariah Slough up by Agassiz, the Upper Pitt River at the head of Pitt Lake, and the Little Campbell River in South Surrey. So all these populations are, are native and unique to these eight watersheds. So the questions, if you want to restore habitat to benefit Chinook salmon, you have to work in these eight streams and ignore the rest? No, not exactly. Because every Chinook salmon produced in the hundreds of streams supporting spawning populations of this species when the entire Fraser River watershed passes down the lower Fraser River through our area, Stashkabuk, on their way to the ocean as, as young fish known as smolts. And some of these then spend quite some time on this journey feeding along the way and where the freshwater meets saltwater in the great Fraser estuary. So if our goal was to help restore Chinook salmon habitat in this area, to make more young Chinook salmon to survive to adults, so some of them could feed other things like us, and maybe those endangered southern resident killer whales we hear a lot about, then you do have a number of restoration targets and strategies to consider. Either our local populations in these very specific eight streams, or along the Fraser Corridor, where these hundreds of populations of Chinook salmon from the upper Fraser are migrating and are feeding and would benefit from habitat restoration to make their lives a little better. So here are some more things to consider when you are developing your restoration plan for these Chinook salmon. So as we've discussed, in every river that Chinook spawn in and rear for a time, each population does things a little different. Just like people, all Chinook groups act differently, do things a little differently. And you get, you need to get to know Mariah Slough Chinook, or Upper Pitt River Chinook, or Harrison River Chinook, or Thompson River Chinook, or the Chaco River Chinook as best you can before you ask the question, what can I do to help them do better in the world they find themselves in today? So the message I want to leave with you is that habitat restoration for salmon is very, very personal, specific to the species, what the population you're involved with, the place you're doing it, and you and the salmon you wish to help need to become close friends and understand each other before you can really help them. And what this means is you have to ask a lot of questions of people that live on these streams, that perhaps fish these populations, that watch these populations. You have to read what is written in the literature. You potentially can go out and do assessments before you take action of the habitats that you're thinking to restore. And while you're there, you're just watching. You're watching how the ecosystem in that river works, how the, the target population reacts in that ecosystem. And then with all this, it's about quietly thinking, really thinking, and asking yourself, what can a human do to make their chance of survival better? And if you come up with an answer that you, you believe in, then take action, if you dare. And if you take action, you need to assess what the impact of those actions were. So I put up this story because it's been in the news quite a bit. And it's, it's relating to a new study, but an old story. But ask the question, if we can change this, will this bring them back? And what it refers to is, as we know, in our area, Skashtamook, there's been great impacts as we develop the landscape on salmon habitat. And they suggest that 85% of the salmon habitat has been lost. So if we could bring back uh, 
that amount of habitat by removing these barriers. They say a thousand barriers, would it bring them back? So first of all, what, what is it? What, what is our tool? What does the toolbox say on te techniques that might be applied? So I'm suggesting if you go to chapter 5.5, five, restoring fish access, you will get an idea of what they're talking about. And in the lower Fraser, we're talking about culverts and flood pump structures and dikes, things like that. All challenging, uh, challenging places to overcome if you're a salmon. How do you get by these large flood structures? So the question then from this headline, I think we need to ask, would would our our local Stushkamuk Chinook salmon from those eight streams, would they be expected to benefit from such a program envisioned by this headline? So if we're talking Chinook, and I would argue it would depend on what population and what action was taken if a benefit was to be realized. As you see, the message is, it depends. So some would say, let's fix that and they'll come back. And I don't think there's a slam dunk here. Or maybe there is, but this is where we have to think. So I'm gonna use two examples and we'll talk to them in detail. Let's get down to specifics. Let's get down to personal with two Chinook populations speaking to this headline. So if I'm, my first guess is one of our key populations here in Stashkamuk is the Upper Pitt River Chinook salmon. Would they benefit if we remove those 1,000 barriers? Nope, I don't think so, not much. But in contrast, the Harrison River Chinook salmon, absolutely, maybe spectacularly. And the question is why? They're all Chinook, aren't they? And this is the thinking part. So let's go exploring and follow these two stories and see if I can convince you that what I have just said might be true. So this is a high level view of Stashkamuk and I've denoted the two watersheds we're gonna talk about that these Chinook salmon populations exist in. The Upper Pitt River, the Red Star. And what you, I want you to notice is the high snow fields and glaciers on either side of the valley that feed the river. <clears throat> and you'll see the river flows down into a relatively large lake, that's Pitt Lake. And then Pitt Lake flows from the lower Pitt River into the Fraser River, a relatively short river. It's tidal. The entire lake is tidal. It goes up and down about a meter, which makes it quite unique in this area and even the world. Now, the Harrison River, uh, shown with the little yellow star, it, its water supply comes out of the lake. It doesn't flow into a lake. It comes out of the lake. And that makes a big difference on the two rivers and the ecology of the two rivers and, in fact, how the Chinook populations react and have evolved, and in fact, how those populations will uh, be impacted by changes on uh, accessing habitats along the Fraser River by removal of dikes or improving flood boxes. So it's interesting contrasting stories, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So this is a high overview of the Upper Pitt River uh, floodplain. A lot of it looks similar to this. So the white features are large gravel bars. And you can see that the main channel meanders through these gravel bars that has multiple side channels. So the stream bed is highly unstable because of the large amount of gravels coming from those snow fields and, and glacier valleys that I showed in the previous slide. And when we get these big winter floods, that gravel moves, the channel shifts, and the river moves from valley wall to valley wall. The gravel bars never get a chance to vegetate, grow forests. They're always moving and unstable. So what it means is the gravel in the Upper Pitt River in the main channel 
is just too unstable for Chinook salmon to lay their eggs and have any chance of them surviving over the winter. They will almost certainly be washed downstream and die to, during the many winter floods. So what does that mean in the upper pit river? That Chinook salmon really only spawn in either stable tributaries, that's small streams that come off of the mountains that are more stable, they might have some lakes in their system to stabilize the water flow, or potentially in some of the side channels of the river that are tucked off to the side, perhaps stabilized by a large, large log jam at their head, but something that gives them a greater chance of not being scoured out during the winter floods. So we have a very large river, but the Chinook can spawn in only very small, unique areas. So one of these unique areas that Chinook salmon spawn in, in the upper Pitt River is called Blue Creek, relatively small stream, coming from the eastern side of the river. And it is a major Chinook spawning area, the lower section of Blue Creek. And it lies about 30 kilometers upstream from Pitt Lake. So what makes the upper Pitt Chinook pretty special and Blue Creek particularly interesting at this is that this population is deemed to be a single conservation unit. And in that conservation unit, Blue Creek probably has up to 50% of that conservation unit spawning in it each year. So what is this conservation unit? What does that mean? So Canada, a number of years ago developed something called the wild salmon policy which defines what a conservation unit is and what it means is it's a groups of wild salmon living in an area sufficiently isolated from other groups that if extirpated or if they disappear are very unlikely to be recolonized within an acceptable time frame so if you want to read more about what the wild salmon policy is, I've provided a link where you can read it in its entirety. It's really interesting, and its goal is to conserve the biodiversity of salmon in Canada. It tells us that we have to conserve certain units because once they're lost, they cannot be replaced. They're unique, unique enough that if you lose them, you can't just replace them by the neighbor salmon population. That's the idea of a conservation unit. So it means the upper Pitt River Chinook are quite unlike any nearby Chinook populations that act differently and do things differently so that they can survive in the upper Pitt River watershed. If you brought other Chinook in, they would survive poorly or may in fact not survive at all because the upper pit is so unique. So these unique traits and behaviors have likely developed over thousands of years. So again, if we lose this population, we will not see Chinook come from other watersheds. So since we, people, are the greatest negative pressure on these unique salmon, it is our moral duty to do what we can to keep them healthy and abundant for future generations to enjoy. And what that means doing what we can to keep Blue Creek a safe place for spawning Chinook salmon. And I'm going to tell you more about that story. So once again, this is a high level view of Blue Creek. And if you look on the left, this is the Upper Pitt River main stem. It looks very similar to the previous picture I showed of it. The main stem is braided, lots of gravel bars. The channel moves around every flood. Nothing is stable in this corridor. But Little Blue Creek, which I've shown with this little blue line, you can barely pick out the creek because it doesn't have these extensive gravel bars. It is very stable as it moves through the floodplain. And if you look at the little red lines, that indicates the lower end where Chinook spawn to and the upper end. There's only 800 meters of this small creek that supports 50% of the spawning Chinook or more in some years of the upper Pitt River 
it is critical habitat. It's critical habitat to protect and if we can restore some of its functionality. So that's what we have done. So in 2019, the upper Pitt River was migrating toward and threatened to take the lower 25%, 200 meters off of this 800 meter section. So that's 200 meters of almost irreplaceable habitat for the Chinook population. So what was done is the lower end was protected by a large rock berm created to keep upper Pitt away from that section of lower Blue Creek as a restoration tool. And it was meant to protect the population from further decline. This was their key spawning habitat and we took action to stabilize it. So there will be spawner counts in future years that will look at population trends, but this was an example in the upper Pitt River of an action taken salmon habitat restoration with the hope it will help this highly threatened small population of Chinook that is unique and called a conservation in its own right. So as I described, multiple parties are involved in uh, the salmon habitat restoration efforts in the Upper Pitt River. And there was a discussion in 220 of ideas. What can we do for Chinook salmon? Chinook salmon, one of the highest valued fish in the watershed. And the reality is we have limited options. What can we do? So what we know is the upper pit Chinook continue to persist at somewhat stable but low numbers, 200, 500 in the watershed. The challenge for the species is that they spawn in a small numbers at a number of inaccessible locations and one location at moderate numbers, that being at Blue Creek. In other words, this large watershed, there's very small populations, some of the smaller tributaries, but just a few fish here, a few fish there, no road access, very difficult to access to do restoration. But Blue Creek's different. We have access with a road directly to the creek. So that's why the 219 works at Blue Creek were done, because it was the only practically implementable works directed at Chinook that we identified in the watershed that the team was aware of. So but the species due to its sparse distribution, variable life history is difficult to help with any single project. However, there is mostly likely small benefits for rearing Chinook juveniles, other, other projects being done in the watershed for species like sockeye salmon that I'll talk about later, or even coho salmon. These Chinook move around in small numbers and will use other habitats that other species use. Now, one area that is being looked at is Boise Creek. It's quite a large tributary that comes from the west, but it has been challenged from uh, heavy logging, logging impacts and channel instability. But there is an effort to look to create a stable side channel for use by sockeye salmon, but it may be attractive for Chinook salmon. We'll find out. So if you want to read more about the conservation status of Upper Pitt River Chinook, um, which in this document are, are the core of what's called the Lower Fraser River Stream Summer Conservation Unit. I give it a link in the presentation. Now the small Chinook spawning population in the Upper Pitt River is likely controlled by the amount of suitable stable spawning habitat available to them, to them in the watershed. So by analyzing scales of adult fish, it gives a hint on how they spent their life as small fish. And it appears that they rear in the extensive and abundant springtime habitat throughout the Upper Pitt River floodplain. So think about the Upper River floodplain, the pictures we saw, numerous back channels, numerous side channels, all very appropriate rearing habitat for these small fish in the spring when the snow's in the hill, hills and the river is calm, these are very good places to rear. And there's an abundant amount of that habitat on the floodplain. So the little fish coming out of Blue Creek have 30 kilometers of really rich springtime habitat, rearing habitat. Now, not only in the floodplain, but as they move down the river, going into one back channel growing, moving downstream slowly, 
they hit Pitt Lake. So they have the shores of Pitt Lake, which are rich rearing areas, and finally the lower Pitt River. So the message is the upper Pitt River Chinook strategy appears to be to produce relatively few fry because the Blue Creek spawning grounds and other spawning grounds can only support so many spawners, but they rear in really high quality river and lake habitats within the Pitt River watershed. So the upper Pitt River Chinook population, while so small in numbers, is stable and has appears to have a strategy of producing small numbers of quality smolts, larger and faster smolts, which are tougher to catch and kill by predators when they head downstream quickly through the lower Fraser River to the ocean. So this sort of is the end of this story. And it gets back to the headline. Wood removing dikes and flood barriers to young salmon along the lower Fraser River floodplain help the upper Pitt River Chinook? And the answer is probably not. Rearing habitat for this small population is probably not what limits the numbers of fish in the population. It's likely the availability of stable spawning habitat, which is small and limited. However, the second part of this story, I mentioned the other population, Harrison River Chinook. And it truly is a totally different story indeed. So let's get to it. It's an interesting one, and I think quite an inspirational one. So we begin the story of the Harrison River Chinook population, which similar to the upper pit is its own conservation unit. But unlike the upper pit, it is the most abundant Chinook population in the entire Fraser River watershed and one of the largest populations in the world. So the numbers of spawner, spawners returning each year ranges from 100 to 200,000 or more each season. Now all these Chinook spawn in a 4,000 meter long section of the Harrison River just down stream from Harrison Lake. If you look at the slide, roughly between the two red lines, that four kilometer reach supports these huge numbers of Chinook salmon each year. So it's a heck of a lot of Chinook and by far one of the biggest Chinook runs in the world. So this is the interesting part of the discussion. Why? Why there? Okay, so let's look at why so many Chinook spawn there. And it begins with the very large Harrison Lake, which means that the water flowing out of the lake is always really clean, even during the worst floods of fall. It's a huge lake with many, many tributaries that in a heavy fall rain and flood carry a lot of silt and sand. But that silt and sand is deposited in this huge lake, which settles out, and at, when the flows leave the lake, they're virtually always clean. So what does that mean? That incubating salmon eggs downstream from Harrison Lake will thrive with this clean water. That doesn't have a lot of silt and dirt that would plug up the gravel and cutting off the flow of oxygen to these eggs. It creates a really high quality incubation environment for eggs. And the Harrison River water is really clean. So the nearby Chehalish River on this slide the blue arrows denote the flow of the Harrison River, but the red arrows denote the Chehalish River, various river mouths over time as this river is moved back and forth across its floodplain. Now the, the Chehalish River, which comes out of the mountain, mountainous area, carries a lot of gravel. So over time, it has effectively deposited gravel all along this four kilometer reach, really good spawning gravel. But once it's in the Harrison River, it doesn't move. It effectively stays in place. It isn't scoured out in floods because Harrison Lake moderates those floods like a big battery. It stores the flood water and releases it slowly. So the gravels that are deposited over time by the Chehalish over centuries, the only thing that really moves it downstream is spawning salmon. 
not necessary flooding. So this is important. If you're a salmon egg and you're deposited in clean gravel that doesn't move, that has clean water flowing over, you get very high survival to, to fry emergence. So another point to consider, the Harrison River Chinook spawning section, the section of the river they use is 4,000 meters long approximately. And this is a big river averaging probably 300 meters wide or wider in some places. And if you do the math, that gives you 1,200,000 square meters of clean, stable, perfect spawning gravel. So thinking about this, a large Chinook nest or red would require about five square meters of spawning gravel in area. So if you do the math again, that 1.2 million square meters would support about 240,000 reds, Chinook salmon reds. So one male, one female, 480,000 spawners. Now remember I said there's one to 200,000, suggesting there is more gravel today than spawners to use it. It's a huge area of gravel, although it's a huge run they still have not hit the limit of their spawning capacity of that reach. So what we know from our studies is that those spawners produce in many years around 30 million or so Chinook fry. These are the little guys that come out of the gravel. And basically that's a lot of mouse to feed. And the question is, where do they feed? Now, if you look to the slide that I've put up, just as an aside, to, to indicate how stable the gravel is, is I pose a question, what is a salmon spawning dune? And then you'll see the little red lines while you're looking at some right now. If you look, it, likes, it looks like the uh, ripples you see on the sand at White Rock Beach but they're ripples of gravel and they might be five meters high from the deepest to the shallowest. They might be 15 meters wide at their, at their crest and they might be 150 meters long. There's a series of ridges of gravel and they're not formed by flowing water. They're form, formed by generation after generation of salmon spawning and lining up beside each other. And over time, they create these large dunes. And because the river is so stable, these dunes are not flattened and washed away each fall. Now you see this only at the outlet of really big lakes with stable outlets, typically associated with, with uh, Chinook salmon, sometimes with sockeye salmon, but Chinook salmon in particular because of their size and the size of their reds. Harrison River has beautiful dune formations that are have been created by generations of salmon over hundreds or thousands of years and it's a thing of beauty which makes the harrison such a special place in our area so where do those 30 million little fry go to when they leave the Harrison River spawning ground. So the little yellow star gives an approximation where those spawning grounds are located. And the, and the green arrows just give a sense of where the Chinook fry are migrating to. There's about 150 kilometers or more of uh, main stem habitat, side channel habitat, tributary habitat that these Chinook fry will uh, move down and then look for rearing habitats. They're looking for the slow edges, the slow back sloughs, the bottom ends of tributaries, and they'll poke their noses at anywhere that they can get into, usually to the head of tide. Wherever the tide goes, that's where you'll find Chinook fry from the Harrison River in the spring. So they rear in these habitats, you know, up to eight weeks and somewhere around early May as the temperatures rise, temperatures getting a little warm for their liking, uh, 
they get to about 70 millimeters they've grown from 40 millimeters to 70 millimeters and they're preparing their for their life in the ocean and begin their migration down to the Strait of Georgia around that time so how can we help them well we can look at all those various areas and look for barriers that might be improved so they can get past them into habitats they want to use or perhaps habitats that uh, can be enhanced for their use or made better possibly ones that have been impacted from past land development we can do some techniques that will just make them friendlier for a little Harrison River Chinook fry for the eight week rearing period so let's go on and talk a little bit about these examples on the Stave River the Salmon River and on the Coquitlam River so we know from our scientific studies of the lower Fraser that these Harrison River Chinook fry often seek out the smallest channels often that are affected by daily tides and these tides can reach as far upstream as the Mission Bridge and the Fraser or even slightly higher and these little fish are most happy in little habitats where big fish won't go and eat them so with this in mind if more early spring habitat that's that February to May period was available in the lower Fraser River floodplain then it's likely that more Chinook would return to use all that wonderful gravel beds in the Harrison River simple when you look at the numbers it is likely the rearing habitat in this case unlike the upper pit example that is limiting the size of the Harrison River Chinook population so if you remember the headline that started this conversation uh, that described overcoming the thousand barriers that deny salmon access to the historic habitat the vast majority of these barriers occur along the tributaries of the lower Fraser River and are largely related to flood control infrastructure the places that these flood structures present, protect are places that Harrison River Chinook once lived a century ago so this is one of the examples of salmon habitat restoration done on the lower Fraser directed at these Harrison River fry it's on the lower section of the Stave River and it's within the tidal reach the tiles tidal range is about a meter and a half in this spot between high and low tide so in the lower Stave River there's a series of old agricultural fields that have been restored to recreate the small tidal channels that existed before they were filled and farmed now it's it is these small tidally affected channels that are highly sought out by young Harrison River Chinook fry to rear in for a couple months each spring prior to their ocean entry and the upper, lower stave is one such area that we've done this type of work so this is an aerial view of a tidal channel restoration project on the lower stave river that was led by um, the Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition in partnerships with Kwantlen First Nation DFO Salmon Enhancement Program and BC Hydro's Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. Again, it's a large project that's tidally effective, so the uh, tidally affected, so the Harrison River Chinook Fry will come up in the with the tide, the channels will fill, they'll feed all along the margins, and then when the tide goes out, a portion will stay and a portion will go back into the main stem state river. There's a lot of movement of water, a lot of movement of food items, and this is exactly the habitats, the critical habitats that Harrison River Chinook Fry are looking for, so they can grow to that critical 70 millimeter size before they head down to the Strait of Georgia. The last picture of this series, I'll just give you a shot of the, one of the channels, just to give you a sense of scale. It's actually a very large project, and it was delivered I think in 2018 in uh, I think they took two seasons of work to complete the entire complex so this is a sort of a construction action shot of how these tidal channels are built 
Uh, this is a channel very similar in form to what we were looking at on the lower Stave River, but this one is on the lower Coquitlam River in an area we call the Sheep Paddocks. The lands that this channel was built on are now part of the Metro Vancouver Colony Farm Parks, and these fields are no longer going to be used for agriculture, so they're being reclaimed for fish and wildlife. Just a few features to notice. The channel meanders, has a natural meander pattern. It has both steep banks and then closer to the water's edge, you'll see a, a much shallower bank and then another steep bank and then the materials in the background where the machine are, are being shaped into a mound. What that allows is a very diverse area for planting different groups of plants. So the lowest areas might be sedges and other wetland, tidal wetland type plants. Then a little higher, some of the shrubs where they're just above where they're planting now. And then the highest points might be trees that don't want to be wet at every high tide. So again, the attempt is to make it good for fish, but also make it good for all sorts of different types of wildlife. This is pretty common in these uh, tidal channel areas. These, they're very high use by multiple species of fish and wildlife. So we do everything we can to make it the most diverse habitat possible. So this is just another picture of the project we just looked at during construction. A season or two uh, has passed. And if you know, uh, living in Scouch de Mook, it rains here and it's mild. So you give a plant half a chance, it grows pretty quickly here. So within a season or two, the, the, um, the disturbed areas are fully revegetated. And that's actually why you should get your, your shrubs and your trees in because the grasses, things like reed canary grass, will, will recover very, very quickly. So you want to push a few more uh, plants in there to maximize diversity as quickly as you can. And of course, all this vegetation generates uh, insects and all those insects feed these little fish that we're trying to help. So these tidal channels are not just important to Harrison River Chinook, and they are important to Harrison River Chinook. But every time tide will bring in, in probably 25 or more different species potentially into these tidal channels. Uh, some of the more common ones are a stickleback, both resident and migratory forms, but also uh, high value species like coho salmon would often spend the winter in these tidal channels. And uh, species like uh, rainbow, which are steelhead probably uh, we'll spend a portion of time foraging in there, maybe in the spring before they uh, smolt up. And cutthroat trout may spend uh, a portion of their year in these channels feeding on the rich um, uh, insect life. Uh, and some of them may be large, almost adult size, and some may be just pre-smolts. So a real diversity in these tidal channels. When you do uh, sampling, you, you look for your target fish, Harrison River Chinook, but you find a wealth of others, which makes it really encouraging when you do this types of work in the lower Fraser tidal range. So the study that got into the headline, talking about 85% of historic rearing habitats denied to salmon, speak directly to Harrison Schnook Fry being denied access to their rearing habits on, habitats on the lower Fraser River floodplain. So most of these lost areas are protected from flooding by the Fraser River by extensive dike systems and pump stations and culverts. So we're looking at the flood pump station at the mouth of the Salmon River on the right is the Fraser River. On the other side of the station is the Salmon River. The Salmon River has to flow through gates under the structure. And when the river's in flood, when the Fraser River's in flood, they actually pump the Salmon River over. At that point, a little fish has no chance of getting into the Salmon River. So we'll be talking about these types of structures. So these stations were designed, many of them were placed in after the great flood of 1948, which flooded large parts of the Fraser Valley. They're meant to keep us dry and safe when the Fraser River goes into its springtime floods in May. But they stop the tides from going into these floodplain channels and are tough barriers for the Harrison River Chinook Fry to overcome. 
So if we could restore young salmon access and tidal flows past these barriers, then the Harrison River Chinook fry would do the rest. It's not easy, but it's also not impossible. So I showed you the pump station at the mouth of the Sand River because it is an example of a structure that was modified to make it more friendly for young salmon to come out of the Fraser River into the lower end of the Salmon River. So in 1999, the flood pump at that station was reconstructed and a small fish passage was placed through this huge structure controlled by an automatic gate. So if the water got too high in the Fraser River, so it might flood homes inland of the flood structure, the gate shut itself automatically. But if the water was not too high, the gate decided it was safe to remain open, simple. This gate structure, which was not simple to get installed, made all the difference for the Harrison River Chinook Fry use of the lower Salmon River in the spring. So the lower Salmon River uh, is really high quality habitat for Harrison River Chinook Fry and they get access and they go upstream about seven kilometers. So that's a lot of habitat for a relatively simple structure. And there's many, many, many of these large flood structures located all along the lower Fraser River at the mouths of many small streams, such as the Salmon River here in Fort Langley. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about the story of how these little fish use the lower Salmon River, I wrote a story for the operators of the pump station, for the residents in the Sam River watershed and the general public, just to let people know these structures need to be operated well. They're there, these structures have an ability to work with the salmon, but we have to do our part because a couple of years ago, people that were operating the pump station forgot what the little gate was for. It was put in in 1999 and people move on People perhaps don't read certain uh, guidelines that are back in uh, 20 years old. So this little story is a gentle reminder. Hey folks, we can do this. We can have our flood structure, but we can also let the little fish go where they want to, which will turn into big fish and feed the killer whales. They'll feed us and they'll make us all proud when they return back to the Harrison River. I'd recommend you have a, have a look at this story. I've given you the link. So we've talked a lot about Harrison River Chinook Fry rearing in the freshwater environments of the lower Fraser. And before we dive into the next part of our Harrison River Chinook story regarding the Big Blue Sea, a little side trip. So studies have shown that it appears that when the now fattened up Chinook Fry head out to the ocean from the Salmon River from the Coquitlam River tidal channels, from the tidal channels on the stave. They ride along with the silty waters of the Fraser River plume and live for a while on the beaches and near shore marine habitats throughout the southern strait of Georgia. Effectively, wherever the Fraser water goes, these guys follow. So roughly from the southern half of Howe Sound in the north, to the San Juan Islands in the south, our Harrison River, which are often noted as Lower Fraser Fall Chinook as a, as a conservation unit, hang out in these shallow, rich feeding areas for a month or two or more before finally heading out to the setting sun out west and the Big Blue Sea. As always, it's complicated. So here's a little picture of what that Fraser River plume might look like. The Fraser River discharges into the Strait of Georgia through the North Arm, the Middle Arm, and the South Arm. And depending on the tidal strength, that plume, uh, when an incoming tide pushes the water north, will enter House Sound, the lower half of House Sound. And when the outgoing tides pull the plume to the south, it'll 
go as far down and even farther as the beaches of San Juan Islands. So the two studies I'm going to show you to give you a sense of where these Harrison River Chinook fry go in the near shore environment are the yellow star in the north and the yellow star in the south. So this is from a House Sound Juvenile Chinook study report in 2012. You'll notice the green circles indicate Harrison River Chinook fry captures. The largest captures were in the beginning of May, about the time we see them leaving the Fraser River sloughs and channels as the water temperatures rise. And by toward June, it looks like their numbers are much less in House Sound as other populations of Chinook move into the beaches there. Again, it's a complex uh, movement of populations that seem to use habitats at different times and places. Again, it appears to be complicated. So this was another study looking at juvenile shook salmon use of near shore areas off the of San Juan area islands. So the lower Fraser summer fall, which is our Harrison River Chinook fry, are the black portions of these circles. So you can see their numbers begin rising in that area mid-April mid through early June and dominate the near shore by mid-June. They're still there in some numbers mid-July and their numbers are dropping rapidly in August. So again, it appears that our Harrison River Chinook fry, while they move out of freshwater, uh, perhaps beginning in May through June, it looks like they are in fact rearing in the Strait of Georgia in the near shore for a significant period of time before they head out into the big blue sea. We have a lot to learn and these are complicated fish and from a salmon habitat restoration, these sorts of studies suggest the health of beaches and nearshore areas may be areas well worth spending some effort in the future. So okay, when Harrison Chinook enter the ocean, there's been a number of studies from our tagging of little fish in freshwater. We put things like coated wire tags. And when a fisherman captures that fish, they can collect that tags and find out where they came from. That's one hint on where Harrison Schnick uh, live in the ocean. The second a tool that has been used is the new genetic tool where again, if a fish is captured in the ocean, it can take a little bit of tissue. And from that tissue can <clears throat> identify what particular watershed that fish was from. But again, it relates to catching those fish. So you have this large ocean. There's only fisheries in certain places. There's only research vessels in certain places. It is largely a mystery where the Harrison River Chinook go when they enter the ocean. What we do know from various fishery samples that the yellow line shown on the slide roughly shows where Harrison Chinook have been found. Most of them seem to stage off western Vancouver Island as they grow. Some go down into the U.S., Washington, perhaps northern Oregon. A few go as far north, perhaps as far north as the Aleutians or south central Alaska. A very large area. We think they largely stay on the continental shelf, but really, who knows? Because we don't sample far offshore very much. So this is a the major part of their life cycle and this is the message of this piece of the story. So after all our hard work, what will come back as adults, the fish we want to come back for our fisheries to feed our whales to see on the spawning grounds will reflect two things. How many smolts went to sea? As we've discussed, that we can affect from our efforts. But how many survived at sea, we will have little ability to affect. And that is a fact we will have to live with. We will have good years 
and we will have bad years largely driven by ocean conditions but there are some truths we have to understand if no smolts go to sea no adults will return we won't get bad years we will get years no salmon return so our actions in freshwater do matter for the future of salmon here in Stashkamook. So for the Harrison River Chinook, perhaps we'll see a year of a fantastic run when the ocean is friendly and all our hard work in freshwater has put a record numbers of smolts into that ocean. And that's, we, that's what keeps us going. But we will also have years when the ocean is not friendly to salmon and just just surviving will be a good thing so the harrison river run doesn't disappear and will live to fight again to fight another day and that's what we do in salmon habitat restoration we give them a half a chance to fight another day and i just want to leave uh this story and point out on the slide there's a, a report that i've highlighted you can click go to the link it's a new study that talks about where harrison river chinook fry and other chinook fry living in the fraser river estuary it's a really good study a really good group of people doing new work and using the new genetic tools to figure out who's in the estuary when it's well worth your time to read it We're back to the headline that started our little story about the upper pit in Harrison River Chinook. And I think the message of this story is habitat restoration is personal. It is site specific, it's population specific. So we have to be careful when we make general statements. So the story that I've worked through with you might be true. I think it is, but who truly knows? We were after all only human but if it is mainly true and the science seems to support the story i told you then the question is could removing a thousand barriers bring them back and again my answer is upper pit river chinook probably not however if you guys get on with your careers and get to work fixing these barriers one by one which is hard and slow work my answer is absolutely well probably this is biology at least for the chinook of the harrison river so here is one such group that has laid out their plan targets identified and they're marching to battle so if you're interested in this subject about flood barriers along the fraser river give this click a try, read what they've written, and give it a little bit more thought. So this is really what habitat restoration is all about. You pick your fights well. You have to be smart, you have to be patient. Many of these things take decades to work out. And when you get a chance, you fight hard, and hopefully you can sit back when you are old and watch. 500,000 Harrison River big, big Chinook splash and dig and be happy each fall in that beautiful place. Simple. But just like all things in nature, it's not simple. There is probably going to be more to this story. And that, my friends, will almost certainly take place in the beautiful and mysterious big blue sea. So this is the end of a small piece of the Stush Kamut Chinook story. Now, as you can see, there will be six more unique stories for the other local Chinook populations and conservation units in this area. And remember what I said, restoration, salmon habitat restoration strategies are personal site-specific, population-specific, time-specific. 
Now, we could also have told the stories of 100 or more Chinook populations that spawned in the upper Fraser River watershed because these mining, migrating Chinook fry and smolts from these upstream watersheds must pass through and rely on our area to feed and grow on their way to the ocean. So their story should matter to us too. So telling all these stories will take days and days and actually understanding each individual story is a lifetime of work for scientists. So as practitioners of salmon habitat restoration, what do we do? Well, we just have to work with the knowledge and stories we have and try to make our most informed decisions when trying to take actions to help these irreplaceable Chinook populations. So I'm going to finish off with one last story about a small and almost forgotten Chinook salmon run living in Mariah Slough here in Skoustamook. And one fellow who would not forget about what, about what he saw in his youth, many Chinook spawning there. Now his name is Clem C Seymour. I first met him on Seabird Island back in 1984. They call him Chief now. I'll always call him a salmon friend. So here's a high level view of Mariah Slough. So it was an active side channel of the Fraser River historically. So it probably flowed strongly during the spring freshet and perhaps the fall freshets of the Fraser River. And we know that it's, it flowed strong enough that in the uh, steamboat era, when steamboats, paddle boats came up the Fraser River, they actually went up Mariah Slough because it was a little easier to go up the slough than fight the main current of the Fraser River. But after uh, 1948, after the great flood of 1948 that flooded the adjacent lands, the upper end was diked off. And this prevented the spring fl floods from coming down Mariah Slough and the fall floods, and it fundamentally changed the nature of the flood. So Mariah Slough is still wet, but it's fed by groundwater resources coming through the gravel of the Fraser River floodplain, and a little bit of water comes out from a tributary called Hicks Creek. And this is the entire flow of Mariah Slough today. So you can imagine when the spring freshet no longer flowed strongly down Mariah Slough, that freshet would have refreshed the gravel, washed away any of the old leaves in the past year, removed any silts that had deposited over the winter. And at the end of the spring freshet, the gravel from one end of the Mariah Slough to another would, would be shiny and clean. Now, perhaps in the winter, when it gets cold in the interior and the Fraser River flows dropped, it the Fraser River would not flow in the upper end of Mariah Slough, which then relied on groundwater and flows from its tributaries like Hicks Creek. But the gravels were, were clean and the salmon had access to spawning areas when they came in and the groundwater in Hicks Creek was enough to allow them to get to these critical spawning areas. But what's happened since 1948 and the lack of scouring or cleaning flows in the spring as Mariah Slough has been slowly filling in with aquatic plants and fine organic sediments. Over time, the amount of usable spawning gravel has declined such that by the 1980s, there were only tens of square meters of gravel patches that were still useful for spawning. What does that mean for salmon spawning returns, particularly Chinook? Well, they had been declining ever since the slough lost this freshet connection to the Fraser River. So by the 1980s, from the fisheries and oceans records and the fishery officers counts, only about 25 Chinook still spawned in Mariah Slough each season. 
And in 1987, which was a drought year, not, somewhat similar to this year, 2021, when Hicks Creek wasn't flowing till very late in the fall and the groundwater resources were depleted, the slough had such low flows, only four Chinook salmon recorded returning to Mariah Slough to spawn. The end of this unique salmon run in 1987 was within sight. So lack of summer scouring flows in the Fraser River, agricultural nutrients coming off the farmlands, and encroachment of reed canary grass from the sides leaf fall in the fall all contribute to the declining quality of salmon habitat in the slough. So by the 1980s, most of the gravel spawning areas in the slough had been covered in silt and grass, and only a few patches of gravel remained. So I'd suggest you read five, chapter 5.8, Restoring Fish Access and Spawning hab Habitat re Rehabilitation in the Toolbox. So from our assessment, the Salmon Habitat Restoration Strategy prescribed to improve conditions for Chinook salmon was to focus on the amount of spawning habitat for salmon in the slough, not the rearing, the, the spawning. So at the same time, because the numbers of Chinook salmon were so dangerously low, those four fish in 87 really were an eye opener. Um, some of the spawners that re returned to the slough, now we were running a downstream or an upstream trap to count the fish in precisely. We took some of the males and females and put them into a conservation hatchery. And the idea was that we needed those fish protected while we were working on the habitat in Mariah Slough, and we did not want the run to disappear before we could get the spawning habitat increased. I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the information and thinking that went into developing our Mariah Slough Chinook restoration strategy. Now, the description I previously gave of the habitat quality within Mariah Slough is generally true, but there are some additional information that we looked at when deciding to focus wholly on spawning habitat improvements rather than on improving rearing habitats within the slough. So early in the restoration program, scales from adult Mariah Slough Chinook were taken and analyzed to assess the average age of return as adults to the slough. So as part of this assessment, the scale technicians made some observations on the rate of growth of Mariah Slough Chinook juveniles during their freshwater phase. Now this is done by looking at the number of rings on the scales and the width between those rings before the Chinook juveniles entered the ocean. When they transition to saltwater, it leaves a certain mark on the scales, so you can tell the period before they entered the ocean. Now what these reading of scales suggested that Mariah Slough Chinook juveniles reared in a high quality rearing environment for a number of weeks before moving directly down to the ocean. So what this suggested was our poor old muck bottomed Mariah Slough with these high level of nutrients was a very good place to be a Chinook fry early in the spring before water temperatures got too high and oxygen levels got too low later in the year. So again, what is degradation for certain pieces of life cycles? In fact, early spring rearing, these areas like the slough tended to heat up quicker because of the dark bottom and because of the high nutrients had a very rich algal environment and a rich insect environment early in the spring exactly when these juvenile uh, Mariah Slushnook were trying to go from that 40 millimeters at emergence to probably close to 7 millimeters before they left the slough. Again suggesting Mariah Slough has a lot of this slow nutrient rich habitat and very little of spawning habitat. That was the logic of our decision. So we talked about how this program had its beginning with a conversation with local individuals. I named Clem Seymour. 
but there were others. And they talked about what they remembered when the slough had just been cut off from the Fraser River and it was still in good shape. So as we went through the process of learning more about the slough from both direct observations of locals from fishery officer report, it was decided that we needed to get more information on what the slough was doing now. What were the salmon resources in Mariah Slough? So a partnership was struck with the Seabird uh, Island Band, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Salmon Enhancement Program, and we worked together to build, install, and operate a fish fence on the lower end of Mariah Slough. And what was this meant to do is to give us precise counts of what came into the slough, particularly Chinook salmon. Now there was another value to the, the uh, trap. It allowed us when the run was very small to take a portion of the female's eggs for that conservation hatchery. Okay, the fence was run for the critical period of recovery 1985 to 1989 when the numbers were very, very small for Mariah Slough Chinook. And it worked great. A fellow named Ron Joe uh, built, installed, and operated this, uh, this trap for those years. And one of the seasons, after we had, had gotten enough experience on how it operated, we decided to run it through the entire winter flood season to see what, in fact, all the salmon populations were like in Mariah Slough. So that would be not just Chinook salmon, which tend to come in the early part of the spawning season, more in September and a little bit into October, but also sockeye salmon, which do exist in the slough, chum salmon and coho salmon. And some of the coho salmon migrate as late as February, even into March. So one year we got an absolute count of all the species entering the slough. And to this day, it's the best data on Mariah Slough salmon population. Again, from a partnership with the Seabird Indian Band, Fisheries and Ocean Salmon Hansard Program, and using committed local individuals like Ron Joe to make sure this program was run well and run well every day. So the Mariah Slough Chinook salmon eggs uh, from adults collected at that enumeration fence that we just so a picture of the eggs were uh, collected, spawned with milk taken from Mariah Slough males and then transported first to the Chehalis River hatchery. And then in later years to the Inch Creek salmon hatchery, both of them are federal facilities. And this is over the period 1989 to 2004. So the, the hatchery program was always envisioned as a so short term support for the population. It was not intended to be done every year. It was meant to only hold the population up while we dealt with the habitat issues. And when the population was deemed healthy, ideally above 500 spawners, then the hatchery program was going to be discontinued. So we knew it was a short term program. So we took advantage while we had the ability to produce these little smolts that allowed us to put coated wire tag in them which helps to assess their ocean distribution and survival to adulthood. And we didn't have this data and that's very difficult to get from tagging wild fish which are very very small and difficult to tag. So four years of smolt releases had coder wire tags. It's a little piece of metal that's encrypted that's put in the nose of these little fish. So when an adult is captured in an ocean fishery and it's missing that little rubbery fin, the adipose fin, it's taken the nose is taken off and that little tag is retrieved and there's a whole program to read those tags. So what we learned was Mariah Slough Chinook, in fact, unlike the Harrison Chinook, which tend to be more to the south, more toward Vancouver Island Way, the Mariah Slough Chinook, the majority of captures were farther north, off of Haida Gwaii. So about mid to northern BC, which was again, supported the feeling that they are different than the neighboring population, those being the Harrison River Chinook. So later we had a genetic, a new tool that we could do the genetic analysis from taking small tissue samples. So we sampled uh, the Chinook as they passed through our enumeration fence 
it was analyzed and then compared to all the other populations in the Fraser watershed. And once again, Mariah Slough did not show a close relationship to any of the neighboring populations, including the Harrison River Chinook, which are just around the corner. What was interesting, the Mar Mariah Slough was more closely related to fish out of the Thompson River, which is a long way from Mariah Slough. So they were a little remnant population, probably left there during deglaciation when Chinook were just returning to the Fraser River and moving into the Thompson. Some of those fish as they passed up the lower Fraser as the glaciers came out of the Fraser Canyon remain there for probably five or 6,000 years when that first wave of Chinook started to go back up the Fraser River. So for that reason, the little population of Mariah Slough was deemed distinct, unique, and it has own conservation uh, unit under the Canada Wild Salmon Policy, which is really good news because there's a higher level of protection given to a conservation unit. Remember, if you if you lose a conservation unit, it's gone. There's no way to replace it. It is viewed as irreplaceable within a reasonable time frame. So stepping back, looking at our program, we came to the watershed. We listened to what local elders and landowners and residents told, could tell us about sh that what they knew and remembered about Chinook and Mariah Slough. We bent, went back to the literature and viewed reviewed the DFO fishery officers report on spawner counts that can go back into the 1940s. Then we worked with local community, in this case the Seaboard Island Indian Band, to initiate a cooperative, cooperative population assessment and science program. We looked where they spawned, how many came in the slough, we captured them, saw how many males, females, what age they were. And we did all this before we did any directed restoration work. So we gathered this information, then we th had a thoughtful discussion with our partners. What, what actions do, you, do we think we can take that will make a difference? And then we made our best guess how to help Mariah Slough and got to work. Simple. So when the hatchery smolts were large enough to be released, they were brought back to Mariah Slough to known spawning sections, those few patches of gravel that remained, or sites that we identified that could be rehabilitated as spawning areas. So the idea that when you release a fish, it's not gonna come back for three to five years. That gives you a period of time to get on with your restoration work. Now, there's a little bit of pressure because if those fish will come back in three to five years, so you really want to have a plan. How would you rehabilitate these areas? And we had a plan and we got to work and those fish, when they came back, I think were very, very happy. So over the period 1987 to 2002, four spawning channels or spawning areas were improved for use by Chinook salmon. And the very first one done was the lowermost one that we refer to as fish trap because that was the location later that a fish trap was put into the top end of that channel. It was experimental. We wanted to see the Chinook use it and the survival of the eggs when they did use it. Now, from those studies, it was decided that yes, we could build spawning habitat for Chinook salmon that they would use and that they would survive in. And over a series of years, we worked our way up upstream on Mariah Slough. So the next channel in the sequence is known as McNeil Channel, named after Chuck McNeil, present band manager of Seabird Island Band, who was instrumental in getting the funding and the nuts and bolts of getting these projects built in partnership with the Salmon Enhancement Program folks of DFO. The next channel up was Clem Seymour. As I've already described, he was instrumental in getting this program going from his concerns as a citizen about the Chinook in Mariah Slough and later as a chief of the Seabird Island Band. And the very last channel, which was done a number of years later when the lower channels were starting to show some signs of filling up, was done on a gentleman's name of Mr. Van Dykes. It was effectively a dry part of his 
of his lawn in front of his house that was the old slew bottom but no longer wetted and we dug a channel through his front yard. So Mr. Van Dyke, we appreciated him stepping up and providing those areas for Chinook salmon restoration in Mariah Slough. And the rest is history. After that, we simply sat back and assessed what did the population do after taking this habitat restoration intervention. And that's the interesting part of the story that we'll talk about. So I just wanted to show a little clip of a female Mariah Slough Chinook. You'll notice her tail is white, which means she's largely laid her eggs in the gravel. If you look at the gravel below her, it's much cleaner than the gravel around her. That's her red. And she will stay on her red until she dies. And what she's doing is she's protecting that clean piece of gravel, which all her life's work is buried beneath, all those fertilized eggs from other fish coming in and digging them up and making their red there. So this little clip, I want you to notice Mariah, Shluk, Chinook, Mariah Slough Chinook are not a particularly large bodied Chinook. And it's probably because they live in a relatively small water body. If you're a large fish, you're much more open to predation by bears and coyotes that often are out down every morning looking for what salmon they can get off these shallow spawning riffles. But also she's quite a dark color and that's called a red Chinook. That means her skin tone has some red color and in her flesh when she was in the ocean would be bright red. Now this is again quite different than Harrison River Chinook which have more of a darker color, more of a gray color, and their flesh is quite pale and they're called a white Chinook because their flesh is almost white in the ocean. Again, suggesting these populations are very, very different. Even though they're very close geographically, they come from different places and different, different uh, uh, genetic uh, pools and uh, backgrounds. So I find it interesting, just a little clip of a Mariah Slough Chinook. So this is a view of the various uh, spawning channels on Mariah Slough. The one on the left is the fish trap spawning channel uh, in its first phase in the uh, mid 1980s. And uh, it was built a little differently. Um, you'll see ridges and actually it's a series of deep pools with ridges. We were trying to figure out how Chinook would actually use these things. But when you're looking for Chinook reds, just as a point, uh, the first thing you notice often is not necessarily the fish on the reds, because often they can be hiding in the pool upstream, but it's those clean patches of gravel. I've just circled one uh, similar to the little video clip I showed you. Off to the right, uh, the Seymour uh, channel. If you see the little yellow circle, uh, you see quite a bit of clean gravel and then just a little deeper water behind. Those are all shown up waiting their turn to get on the gravel for spawning. So again, this is what they look like. They're anywhere from six to 10 meters wide and a little less than a foot deep when they're flowing in the fall. So this is just uh, pictures of the other two channels on Mariah Slough, Andrews Channel, and the Van Dyke Channel. And again, once again, I've just circled in yellow these groups of salmon. These are Chinook salmon. They've been spawning in, uh, in the channel. And a little bit like we described on the Harrison River, because this is so stable and the gravel doesn't move except if a fish moves it, you'll notice actually there's ridges and pools, ridges and pools. Those are actually the forming salmon dunes, salmon spawning dunes. And they form in these channels just like they do in the much larger Harrison River. Anyway, point of interest, these are the two channels in the upper portion of the slough. So the numbers of fish that returned were quite impressive. And it was partly from, I think, this hard work in the freshwater, but also probably partly because the ocean during this period was friendly to salmon. So as the runs came in, sometimes higher than the next, and hitting levels that we had, no one had recorded in recorded history, you could see the euphoria that the team felt that we were truly making headway. And this should give the Mariah Slough a good chance to survive for at least another generation forward. So looking at this little uh, graph, you can see back in the 80s, 85, 86, 
there was magic 87 where they virtually disappeared very very low numbers um, the fish fence um, we did have the fish fence we started to get the fish fence in and about 96 you can see the numbers starting to show some signs and then these 202 they just went straight up the wall we went looks like almost 900 spawners and then down a few more years and then up for the the really high of 1500 spawners in 213. so these were phenomenal numbers compared to the 20 30 10 4 of the 80s truly a remarkable recovery um, an example of I think a restoration program that was well planned and well delivered but here is the other part of the story the big blue sea part no matter what is happening in the freshwater no matter how many smolts are going to sea the sea still dictates how many what proportion at least of those will survive because the ocean we know is a dynamic and changing environment so the last data on this graph and the last data I have available right now was 214 and you'll notice the run is down it's not catastrophically down but it's down and um, it was the beginning of a warning of something that was coming our way and this is where I want to remind you of that word humble. I used it in the beginning of this discussion. Some things we have some control over, particularly, let's say, spawning, available spawning grounds in Mariah Slough. Some things we have a little bit of control, the rearing habitat in Mariah Slough and the Fraser River, as I've talked about some other habitat projects. Uh, but the ocean we have no control over. So let's sort of carry on the story. So after all the cheering died down and patting ourselves on the back, the real world poked us in the ear and let us know it called the shots, not us. The real world was, of course, the big blue sea issue. And in fact, from 213 to 216, a large and warm pool of water formed in the eastern North Pacific, affectionately known as the blob. So warmer ocean waters are generally seen as bad for young salmon trying to grow quickly in the ocean, and many don't survive during these warm water events. Warmer water changes the ecology of the ocean. Different food items are available to the young salmon, and it turns out in warmer waters, these food items aren't as nutrient rich and or dense, so the young salmon don't grow as quickly, and if they don't grow as quickly, of course, uh, their predators are always chasing them, so the bigger is better, and anyway, at the end of the day, survival is much poorer during these warm water events. Now, this 213 to 216 blob was particularly particularly large in size and nasty in character so everyone particularly the ocean scientists were scared what it would do to all the little salmon entering the ocean from 213 to 216. well we were about to find out in mariah slough so beginning in 214 if you remember uh, from the previous slide, Maria, Mariah Slew Chinook returns started to decline and collapsed once again to low numbers in over the years through to 219. So it was a blast from the past. It was sort of like the 80s show once again. So it's a lesson for all of us to think about. When these things happen that we do not control, we have no control over ocean ocean uh, uh quality ocean environment with these little salmon from Mariah slew entered do we just give up or do we just do what we've learned think of what we did right and get on with it so in 219 more chinook eggs were collected for the conservation hatchery program for Mariah slew now this hadn't been done for probably five years because we've had we had excellent escapements previous but in 219 it was started and an effort was was made to begin clean cleaning the spawning areas 
that had been built, you know, some of them up to 20 years before, just to help those Chinook that did survive the blob. The idea that uh, any returning survivors would find optimum spawning conditions so their eggs had the highest chance of survival when they uh, were laid in, the, in these newly cleaned spawning areas. So here we are, 2021. The blob is now history. The ocean is once again friendlier for young salmon, and the numbers of Mariah Slushinook are once again increasing. So what's the messages from this ex example? Well, the Mariah Slu team is just picking up their game, and they're proving they are in, in this for the long haul. And that is the most important lesson you could take away from today. We're in this for the long haul. This is the landscapes we share with salmon. And it really is up to us what we do, how we treat the land, and what we do on the land, which will, to a certain degree, dictate the future of salmon in our area. Of course, the ocean issues will, will be the ocean issues. But there's a, there's a simple rule. If no smolts leave the freshwater environment to go to the ocean, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad conditions in the ocean. If lots of smolts go to the ocean, we will get good years. And we will get some bad years. But we hopefully will be able to help our salmon populations persist in good and bad years. And that is the message. We are in this for the long haul. Anyway, that's the end of our story about our Tai team. I gave you three examples of three populations that are quite different. I think the message also is that when you develop restoration strategies, it has to be a very personal thought process in that each population does do, particularly with Chinook salmon, does do things quite differently. So your strategy has to reflect that. What tools you use in your from your toolbox, that is reflected on the on the nature and character of the population you're trying to help. So anyway, hopefully this uh, generates some uh, thoughts, some discussion, and perhaps if you are thinking about a Chinook population that you care about uh, gives you an idea what strategies you might be thinking about to help your fish that you care about. So here is a reference list of the various links we discussed in the presentation. Uh, reference number one uh, discusses uh, 15 years of research at Carnation Creek, BC, where they looked at the impacts of forest harvest practices on fish and fish habitat. Reference number two uh, is the Fish Habitat Rehabilitation Procedures Manual by Slady, 1997. Reference number three is Community Advisor Contacts. Reference number four is a video about how each of these species have quite different uh, critical habitat needs. Reference number five, again, it talks about the different species use of habitats, another video. Both of the videos are really quite interesting to look at. So this is just additional references that were uh, talked about in the presentation. Reference number six is the wild salmon policy. Reference number seven uh, is a document talking about the conservation status of the Upper Pitt River Chinook. Reference number eight is a short story on the Harrison River Chinook fry migration down through the pump station into the lower Salmon River. And reference number nine is a video presentation explaining the impacts of flood infrastructure along the lower Fraser River and some of the associated impacts on salmon and some solutions to these impacts.